We are joined by Lori Dutrell, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance Malawi Team Leader, and Emmanuel Ngalube, Humanitarian Assistance Officer at the Malawi Mission. Lori and Emmanuel will now provide a brief introduction. Over to you, Lori and Emmanuel. Thank you, Emily. Uh, good evening and uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, first, I'd like to, to recognize a few folks. Um, I was able to see uh, the registration list and then I'm seeing people check in. So um, welcome to uh, my USA BHA colleagues. Um, I see Ju Judy Kanawati is, is attending. So good to see you, Judy. I also uh, would like to recognize our uh, very supportive uh, AOR, Faduma Tahil, who's handling our portfolio now for BHA at the moment. And then, of course, um, my BHA team here in Malawi. Um, you're going to hear from Emmanuel shortly. Um, but then uh, we're not just two people, we're also a full team. Um, Kumbakani, Killian, and Steve. Um, we're a, a unit, we work well together, and um, the whole team had something to do with making sure that this presentation happened today. Um, of course, I will also recognize, recognize my mission colleagues. I think Keith, Colin, Maurice are there from the SEG office, and then I think I see some HPN folks as well. Um, and none of this would happen, of course, without our implementing partners. So thank you, Tita Kalani, WFP, FuseNet. Um, it's great to see all of you participating and eager to learn. Um, this is the first of a few um, webinars that are going to be coming out of this office. Um, many of you are familiar with um, these learning opportunities, but this one is kind of special because one, it's the first one as um, you say in Malawi's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And I just wanted to point out a few things um, that make it kind of special, right? Because now that we're the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, um, we're a little bit broader in terms of our scope and our responsibility. Um, and it also highlights um, a few things in terms of uh, how BHA will continue uh, to focus on learning and applying results to our activities, things that we've learned from Food for Peace point of view, OFDA point of view. And now that we're BHA, we really can take all of those efforts and making sure that we're moving BHA forward. So one of the ways in which this um, webinar is important, I think, is it highlights the importance of the findings of evaluations in our efforts to improve design, implementation, and effectiveness. Um, not only in Malawi, but a lot of these lessons can be applied to other settings and other environments. This webinar is also very important in terms of contributing to learning about the humanitarian development space, right? There's a full continuum. Um, it's not an either or. Um, oftentimes the humanitarian space and development space overlap. Um, and in Malawi, it's very nuanced. So this uh, webinar, I think, will give us some highlights and things to think about um, as we operate um, in these spaces and overlap with each other. And then finally, I think this webinar is really important as it gives an opportunity to see how evidence generated uh, can give us learning opportunities and improves our programming um, as we're beginning to see increasing higher levels of shocks um, and intensities um, affecting communities. So I think that's one of the themes uh, that may come up um, in this presentation. Um, I encourage all of you to you know, take notes. Of course, you're going to get copies of it, but there are different aspects of it that can be applied not only to design, but also to actual activities that you're implementing right now. So um, with that, um, please keep an open mind, open ears, um, learn as much as you can, share, and um, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. And um, over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori, and uh, good afternoon from Malawi. Uh, I've already been introduced. Actually, I'm the humanitarian assistance officer from uh, the BHA Malawi team. And uh, I served as uh, activity manager for ballet program. Of course, it was teamwork as usual. Uh, I'll give you a brief, uh, just a brief background on uh, ballet program, uh, which is uh, a 60 million, which was a 60 million five year US food for peace funded development food assistance program awarded to Catholic Relief Services led consortium in September 2014. Uh, Ubale itself is an acronym which is well-crafted 
actually stands for United in Building and Advancing Life Expectations. It also gets very interesting. Ubal itself in our local language, Chichewa, means partnership, actually signifying the implementation strategy that uh, Ubale project adopted, you know, in uh, directly involving the government of Malawi and community structures and beneficiaries as they were implementing uh, activities. Uh, the Ubale consortium led by CRS included Save the Children, Care International, CADECOM, NASFARM, and NCB Eclusa. Uh, NAS Farm and CADECOM are local NGOs, so it was part of uh, uh, Ubale's strategy to build local capacity by incorporating local NGOs into its uh, program. Uh, the program covered three districts, uh, Blanta Arulo, uh, Chikwawa, and Insanje, and reached all the 26 traditional authorities. These are demarcations that we have in Malawi and uh, targeted over 248,000 direct beneficiary households. Uh, the program's overall goal was to reduce chronic malnutrition and food insecurity and uh, increase resilience among vulnerable populations in the three districts. I think these were the challenges that we are facing at that time and we thought Ubale would be well fitted actually to address those challenges. Um, Ubale resources, I mentioned, were about 60 million. This also included food commodities specifically for complementary feeding of mothers and children. What was interesting about Ubale was that during the five years of its implementation, each year was different and it had its own challenges. I can tell you that uh, Malawi experienced the worst floods, West droughts and four animal infestation during the life of Obali activity implementation. These disasters actually uh, resulted in unprecedented humanitarian responses in Malawi, for those, who, those of you who have followed Malawi activities. As Malawi BHA team and the mission, uh, we are very excited since we provided oversight on Obali and we are excited to learn from the evaluation results so that uh, we can improve on performance of our current and future activities. Thank you very much. Andy, over to Emily. Thank you so much, Laurie and Emmanuel. Um, I will now pass it over to Monica Mueller, who is a Senior Technical Advisor at Tango International. Monica will be our moderator for the Q&A portion of today's event. Over to you. Thanks, Emily, and uh, thanks, Emmanuel and Laurie, for your introductions. Um, I won't take too much time, but I wanted to um, introduce and recognize the entire evaluation team uh, from Tango International. And for those of you who don't know Tango, um, Tango stands for Technical Assistance to NGOs. And we have staff and consultants all over the world. We are based in uh, the US in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I sit. Um, the picture behind me is not Tucson, it's a glacier in Chile. Uh, we try to do what we can to stay cool here in Tucson where it's going to hit 45 <laughs> Celsius this weekend. Anyhow, um, first I'd like to introduce T uh, Luis Ramirez, who is the team leader of this evaluation and is our main presenter today. He will be joined uh, in the background um, by some other team members who will be available during the Q&A session. First, we have uh, Jean Downen, who was on the team uh, Jean is also uh, Vice President at Tango International and uh, the Chief of Party for this set of end lines that Tango has been doing over the last year for Food for Peace. Also in the Q&A room, we are going to have Stephanie Martin, who was one of two quantitative analysts um, who worked with the, uh, the end line survey data. Um, so Stephanie will be available for survey and quantitative questions. Uh, I want to recognize also Tom Bauer, who was also one of the main analysts. Other folks on the uh, qualitative team were uh, Joseph Ndengu, uh, who was a WASH specialist, and Ruth Harvey, who was our maternal child health and nutrition specialist. And of course, uh, we cannot be more grateful to have worked with our, our wonderful partner in Malawi, Center for Agricultural Research and Development, known as CARD. 
So they were the ones who conducted and implemented the quantitative inline survey. So I think that covers everyone. I will take no more time and pass the mic over to Luis. I will see you all during the Q&A session. Thanks, Luis. Over to you. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for the support from USAID, from the mission, and also from all the different intern, uh, implementing partners who really help us to implement and work this. We really hope that this helps to push the envelope in terms of programming for future initiatives. So let me move and I'm going to walk through the presentation. There is a lot of information in the report and there is also a lot of information here on the presentation, but we really want to have more time for the questions and answers. So let me just start uh, presenting some of the points uh, the context and the methods, although Emmanuel already mentioned a lot of the context where the projects were implemented in the southern districts of Malawi and implemented by CARE, Save the Children, uh, CADECOM, uh, NASPAN was also supporting over there, and CARE. And some of the interesting area, this is a very interesting area because it's an, an area where definitely every year, as um, Emmanuel already mentioned, it was a different area, a different year with different uh, complications. Uh, there were high climate variability, something that really affected the program. Um, this is also an area which uh, food production depends heavily on red fed agriculture, although people also uh, produce food in the rivers, they were also affected by floods. And we have also other areas outside the program and outside the environment like market variability that affected uh, also what the program was really uh, trying to achieve. The methodology, basically the evaluation had two elements. We have a quantitative survey, was a population-based survey, and also a qualitative portion that help us to understand what um, the numbers we're getting and trying to understand what were the results. We implemented focal group discussions. We also interviewed key uh, partners and did also field observations that will help us to understand what happened and to put together um, the report. What worked? In general, big general terms, um, definitely working through government structures and traditional structures help to support and help to coordinate activities on the field. Uh, working with traditional authorities at the community level really bring out the legitimacy of the project and how the project was implemented and being able to reinforce the mobilization and participation with participants at all levels in the community. Also, the integrated approach was really helpful and it really supported uh, activities on health and food production and income generation and also community mobilization. And as I mentioned before, and it was mentioned before, um, external shocks really affected during the project. And those are some of the points that we're going to, to see and some of the outputs and some of the activities that happened with the project. The purpose number one was really focusing on increasing household uh, income. And um, it was very successful to work, as I mentioned before, working with the, uh, building the capacity of the government. And in terms of agricultural activities, the extension uh, strategy working through the agriculture extension development officers was something that really helped to allow the project to reach pretty much all the different areas where the project was targeting. And at the same time that was coming together, working with uh, low tech and low cost technologies that were really appreciated. And those were also uh, things that farmers understood and farmers were willing to implement, especially using the baby, the mama, the, the mother plot and the baby plot. That is, that, that strategy worked very well. So farmers were able to see what happened. It was something that they were able to uh, implement and they were um, continue using it even after the project ended. What didn't really work that well sometimes was the ratio in terms of the edos and the farmers, but this again was something that was supported working together with the traditional farmers. 
Then their first were also very successful. Farmers, they really appreciate that. Uh, however, they really needed external sources of fund funding, basically, in order, so it was not really sustainable. However, when we were over there, uh, government officials were trying to find the sources in order to implement it. it. This was a very nice strategy that helped farmers to get in, to get to learn new experiences from each other and also to be able to access um, agricultural inputs and supplies. It was also linked also to uh, helping and how to improve the use of these new varieties that they were promoting. Um, Another thing that was very successful was uh, how the project was focusing also into shifting in crop diversification. And this had to do not only on traditional crops like maize and moving maize from the traditional varieties to hybrid that were faster maturity, but also introducing new varieties. And these are some of the things that farmers really appreciated because they were able to use and have different strategies to cope depending on the conditions on the year, either droughts or floods. And again, having a low cost and simple technologies, that was something that the farmers really appreciated and they were able to implement and use. Uh, the pick bags were also appreciated. Uh, it was very interesting because uh, farmers really look into that. They saw how that uh, those um, really helped them to improve um, their um, keeping and improving their post harvests and reducing losses. It was a really challenging at the end of the project because of the changes in terms of the weather and how that affected the yields. Uh, it also affected the, no, the quantity of grains that they had and also the income. So it was, um, it was noted several times that uh, farmers were trying to identify or use the pig bags. Sometimes they couldn't find them because the providers were a little bit far away from their villages. Um, but it's something that the farmers appreciated. Um, and they really like to be able to have access to those. Natural resource management as well was something that was really appreciated. And although this was uh, supported with food for assets, we saw after the project ended that many of these activities continue. Farmers were using and they were having tree nurseries and they continue working uh, in other activities that supported the natural resource management in their communities. Something that was very interesting and uh, was that some of the indicators really, uh, we noticed that didn't improve during the life of activity. And again, the explanation that we have for that is that the different shocks that happened during the year and also the timing of when we were doing the quantitative uh, analysis and collecting the data that was just after uh, the cyclone hit, it really affected on how farmers were using and implementing some of these technologies. However, when we did the qualitative uh, survey, uh, we saw that people who participated on the project, they knew about this, this and they were actually implementing. So these are the things that when we say that external shocks affected the whole population, that is some of the things that were captured in the quantitative survey. But when we did the qualitative, we saw that participants, they really, really were using some of the uh, uh, lessons learned and technologies that were transferred. The silks, it's something that is really working, is vibrant, is functioning, is really helping women and men in the communities, especially in those areas where there are no uh, formal financial services. It really helps and supports the resiliency on the families and farmers and communities. We saw many cases where women were able to uh, spring back and also farmers after there was a flow or a dry because they had access to funds at the community at the same time. Um, value change activities was something that the project was also supporting very much. Um, there were good examples where they were able to harvest and be able to sell it, but at the same time, there were also some other examples especially in 2017 when there was a problem with the market of the um, 
um, region B's that affected, and that really is something that discouraged a couple of the uh, farmers groups. And however, the marketing clubs and the marketing associations are when we visited and we were able to talk with different farmers associations and farmers, they saw that this was a very good in initiative. They really like it and they really needed the support from NASMAN, not only in the training, but also in the support on working on collective sales uh, and how to improve the quality of the work that they were doing. Uh, we saw several of those that were working and some of the challenges that they saw is that they needed uh, a place to be able to aggregate their crops so they can have the, the buyers come in one day and buy the whole production um, and definitely getting support in terms of the standardization of the, of the production to have a quality product to be able to sell to buyers. Um, financial services, in some of these areas, one of the main problems is that formal financial uh, institutions, they don't really reach because it's too far away, their cost is very difficult, and that's where the silks are functioning very well at the farmer or individual level. Um, However, when uh, there was some of the interest of the organization of the project Ubali was to more and increase formal financial services. And there were some, com some challenges at the beginning and they eventually decided to start forming a new SACO in this area. Um, some of the lessons learned over there is that it's important to have more time at the time to implement that. Uh, you need more time in order to really set a financial institution. You also need more time in order to bring the demand so the SACO could, can be uh, sustainable. At this moment, when at the moment that we did the, the field visit and we talked with different organizations, they were receiving external support from other organizations and they were not clear they will be able to function and there was a proposal to merge it with a larger organization on the ground. Again, lessons learned is do it from the beginning, uh, have a more, a larger number of participants that can really support and create the demand for the services. Youth is an area that was also, uh, the project was working. Um, we felt that uh, there were some issues that there was a lack of, um, uh, with regards having a clear agenda on the project for youth. They were really supporting and transferring communication mes messages in different areas, health, nutrition, pregnancy. But there was a big opportunity over there to support youth in agriculture and non-agriculture activities as well. And community animal workers. This is something that if you participate in, an, in, the, in the coming uh, a webinar uh, for Injera, um, they also work a little bit closer with the government in order to support more uh, community animal health workers. Uh, with Ubale, if farmers and people really appreciated the training, but there was a lot of uncertainty about how it was going to work and they didn't have really storage for vaccines and also how they were going to be credited by the government. An area that the project was also really supporting in terms, and this is going to be also linked with the gender participation and gender part was that uh, they really improve in all the indicators about participation in the decision making at the household level with regards to their income. And we saw that women were participating more and taking more decision about what they were, the money that they were making, and men were also more inclined to support and talk together. So this is also another area where Ubale had a very good strategy to work with community leaders, with uh, government officials, and more important with farmers, men and women. Um, in terms of nutrition status, these are the areas where the project also was able to link uh, uh, food production activities with uh, nutrition uh, activities. And although there were some problems uh, because of the droughts and the floods in terms of food availability, we were able to capture that the consumption of nu nutrients rich 
value commodities increase. Um, and there were a couple of issues in there. One was, remember that I mentioned that in 2017, there was a problem with the pigeon B that it was not able to be sold, but that became available at the community and the community was able to use it to increase and uh, the diversification of food at the, at the household level. So, um, what are some of the things that in health really work very well is that Uvalde really work and supported government policies to implement the national care group model. Um, this is something very important because it really focuses on working on the 1,000 days, the first 1,000 1, days of the children, which is the right target age group, and they were really reaching all the TAs and all the communities in the target area. Wally really implemented and worked with a large number uh, the structure from the government and also from the communities, um, not only working in health and nutrition, but also in water and sanitation. And they were really reaching uh, very large numbers of people and a very, very clear and number of activities that supported the government policies to support health and nutrition in those areas. The care groups actually we're implementing all the manuals that have been already defined, designed by the government. Uh, and these were really appreciated not only by the government officials because it was supporting their work, but also by the community volunteers and mothers that they really learn a lot from the implementation from these models. And this is something important because after that we when we were um, doing the evaluation six months after the project ended, uh, volunteers and people participating in that, they were proud of what they learned and they really like uh, keep working and supporting the community even after the project ended because they felt that they learned a lot and because they also were looking at results. Um, there were the complementary feeding and learning sessions where they were also very appreciated as well. And it was interesting. And we were going to see that some of the results because the stunting was reduced. These sessions were starting to go away little, little by little because the, the general nutrition of children were, was improving. Um, two areas that were very interesting with the health component, uh, and I'm going to mention first uh, the grandmother groups. That was something that was started probably at the, in the middle of the project, but it's something that it really got a lot of track in terms of helping and supporting how the project was implemented and how the project was really reaching into the families, working through grandmothers. Um, and then, uh, it really helped and supported. Unfortunately, it was not during the whole project, it was just at the end, but I would say this is a lesson learned, this is something that could really be looked at in future projects as well. Uh, we do have the mother and child regions uh, during the, the hundred season, and this is something that as well, Emmanuel mentioned before, we saw uh, that it really had a very good impact in terms of the nutrition of children and mother. It was really appreciated uh, at the community level. Uh, but again, the important thing, and this was a question that we had, is that if people were going to the care groups because of the rations, after the project ended and there was no ration, we saw women still participating on the care groups. Um, significant outcomes, well, children under five, the stunting and underway, uh, there were significant reductions of that, although there was no major change in wasting on this, on this age group. Um, there was a significant reduction in stunting on children under two and also in stunting um, on between 24 and 25 months. Again, this is something very important and, and this is what I was just mentioning, the care group model implemented with all the different components and targeting the right gauge group and with the right interventions works. Um, again, we don't really have enough data to be able to tell that and justified some of these results in 
in statistical terms. However, when we were able to talk with people, they saw a reduction in terms of the number of diarrhea cases. They saw a reduction in terms of severe malnutrition. They saw that uh, a lot of the sessions um, help really to do a lot of the screening and helping to detect uh, if there were some problems and support the referral system. And again, these are some of the issues when we were doing the populations-based service that it was looking at the whole population while compared with the participants on the project who were really happy and were supporting what really uh, activities that were implemented. Um, again, some of the um, some areas that we didn't have enough information in order to to support that but we had a lot of um, focal group discussions and comments from women, from uh, government officials, uh, volunteers, uh, supporting the work on what the project did and how these structures continue working even after the project ended. Um, again, having the project reaching all the communities, it, it supported the participation, the uh, high participation of children under two on the monitoring activities. Um, and also something that was also linked again with gender activities is that more men were participating on these talks in order to understand what happens and what had to be done. And that really helped in terms of changing practices. Um, we also saw an improvement, um, although it was too small, and these are some of the things that will be interesting for future projects, to be able to um, capture how was exclusive breastfeeding. Again, in the qualitative survey when we were just talking, health authorities and also mothers and, and, and volunteers, they saw that uh, early breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding was really helping and supporting the growth of children. We believe it's not only one single factor that helped to improve the nutrition was a condition of children. There were several factors and this is the issue, the importance of implementing an integrated approach like community care group model. Um, minimal acceptable diet it was also um, some of the numbers that we got from the um, qualitative survey indicated that was, there were reductions in those numbers but again the project every year had an external shock either floods uh, there was even the uh, fall army worm uh, the the cyclone and that affected food production and food availability um, and also affected food uh, diversity um, the third component of the project was to work and support uh, the local traditional structures. Um, the project really helped to revigorate and use that structure from the government to be linked also with the traditional structures and provided training to different committees. Uh, the Village Civic Protection Committee, the Village Natural Resource Management are some of the examples of people who were trained in, were um, made to work and support activities at different level in, in the project. Um, some of the challenges is that because there was turnover in the in the committees and they needed to have some refreshment trainings and actually also with the recent government um, guidelines that they needed to do was some turn changing some of those members. There were some concerns that if the new members will also be trained. We talked with government officials and they said it's part in their plan that they were going to do a new set of trainings for that. Um, but the interesting thing is that when, again, six months after the project ended and we were visiting, uh, these committees were functioning. We saw people that they were already mapping those areas of risk. They, we saw that they were identifying areas where people who were displaced because of the floods could be moving over there. Um, they were linking to the National Fund for Disasters. So these things were, uh, the project was able to provide that foundation to work and the committees continue working and supporting natural resource management and also civil protection activities over there. And these some of the biggest advantages of working with traditional leaders who identify key areas to work on these committees, but at the same time, how to adapt based on the what it is needed on the ground. 
And this is another area where youth, uh, there was probably a missing opportunity how to engage youth in some of these activities to support, a, and eventually these youth who are going to be part of these committees. So that would have been very good. Um, gender, again, as I mentioned before, there were some very good areas where um, the project was working and supporting training a gender champions and they were providing um, messages. Um, more women were participating at the decision-making level at the villages, um, more men were sharing household chores in order to support women to participate in different activities. This was very positive. Um, it's also we saw more women participating in financial activities and with the silks and also with the uh, marketing and clubs and association clubs. And that, that's something positive that is helping and supporting the program. We saw key factors that help and support uh, the sustainability of the project and definitely working and supporting government structures and government policies uh, that really help and support activities after the project ends. Promoting low cost technologies and local available that farmers see that they can implement it, that is not difficult for them. It also helps the sustainability. Um, greater gender equity, that is something that really helps um, to promote good practices to be implemented, but at the same time to continue being implemented. Finally, uh, getting into the recommendations of the project, um, is definitely very important to work and link with the private companies and buyers uh, in order to promote more income generator and activities from agriculture. Also, it's very important uh, to have a watershed management strategy to support the natural resource and management activities so the farmers and communities, they can have a plan and they can work on that. Uh, whenever it's possible and available, small irrigation skills uh, schemes that really can help not only to build food security, but also income generation and youth and entrepreneurship. Uh, we also look into uh, activities that can help youth outside agriculture activities as well. Whatever live, live, livestock is an important part of the income of the family, some livestock activities should also be looked into a strategy. Um, we already mentioned uh, the timing, had provide enough timing for the financial institution if you're going to create a new one. Um, they work within the policies on the, on the government uh, in terms of health, uh, implementing the government, the care um, model, the care group model was certainly something that needs to continue. At the same time, pay attention on volunteers um, because that was really important to have this cadre, this group of volunteers to support the implementation of the programs from the beginning. Uh, link with the water management and also with the latrine constructions as well. And to the final two things are more in terms of being able to capture better information for better decision, implementing a resource-based management system and also a baseline that allows um, to be able to compare data working with children under two. Um, I would like to keep talking. Um, the project was fascinating. It got some very good experiences and lessons learned. The report is going to be available with more detailed information. And I would like to pass this to Monica for the questions and answers. Thanks, Luis. Um, yes, lots of information. <laughs> um, we have generated a few, or the audience has generated a few good questions. Um, I'm going to start actually with a few questions to Stephanie Martin, quantitative analyst, um, to give Luis a chance to take a sip of water <laughs> and also just to get uh, maybe a, a, a broader view of, uh, of the quantitative methodology and findings. So Stephanie, I'm going to read you two questions and maybe you can uh, just speak generally to both. Um, one is regarding the, um, the findings on men's and women's cash decision making. Oh shoot, I just uh, lost that. Okay, yeah, um, basically did that finding use any counterfactual? And then the other question is whether the results were compared uh, with results from non-intervention areas to prove attribution. And, and that question is specifically about the results in stunting, underweight and wasting 
but perhaps you could talk a little bit about the general methodology and that would uh, cover both of these, these questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Monica. Um, in, to, to answer your question, we, we did, we're doing, or we're almost finished with a secondary analysis, looking at what we're calling participants compared to non-participants. And these are households in the survey who self-identified as participating in Ubali programming. There's, it, it, is, um, it is a really coarse, coarse representation because people often misremember either the respondent is not the one who participated and they, they say, no, they didn't participate or they received programming from another, uh, another organization and they say, yes, they participated. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not very precise, but we wanted to better understand the results that we're seeing, especially the results that went down. The key issue in that, at least in my thinking, is, is it's not such a big deal if they went down in the end line. If they started much, much lower, I mean, we wanted to look at relative change between participant and non-participant groups. As it turns out, we did not see much. I think the biggest issue was that we don't have a participant equivalent in the baseline. Usually when we set up these kinds of surveys to do these kinds of comparisons, we start with beneficiary uh, IP databases and use that to stratify the sample. This is, as I said, it was a really coarse measure. And if we have people accidentally saying, no, they didn't participate when actually they did, then that will inflate the non-participant results and make them look better. We did not see, um, we did not see differences at the under five children level between participants and non-participants on any of the indicators. However, it's, probably because the sample size gets really small really quickly. We drew the sample to be representative at the, at the project level at N-Line, which is 500 and something children under five. And the you know, when, once you split it up into participant and non, and especially when you get down to male and female, you're looking at sample sizes of about half that. Um, we, the question about the women's Decision making was the same thing happened. We didn't see differences between participants and non-participants, but for some of those samples, we're looking at we're looking at you know 90 respondents. So it's really hard. You have to have massive differences for them to show up with that few of observations. But my question back to the IP people is: in the data, we saw that 35 percent of the population that we surveyed self-reported as participants, does that match with your experience on the ground? Is that anywhere near accurate? Do we have a, any kind of proxy for participa participation? I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, another question uh, that speaks both to methodology um, that I'd like to put to both Stephanie and Louise is, is from the mission. To what extent are these results reflective of the performance of the DFAP across the five years that were so different? Are the results just a reflection of the frustrations respondents were experiencing at the point the survey was, was implemented? So I open that to both Stephanie and, and Louise. It's, so the, I, it's, the, okay. it's, the, it's the last question in the Q&A. Uh, okay, I have, a, I have a thought about that from the quantitative data. I, my sense is that people, we, have a, we had a shocks module in the questionnaire that asked about self-reported exposure to 14 shocks. All of them recorded or the change between baseline and end line show them going down. I mean, two points do not make a trend. We don't know if they actually went down. I mean, I looked at the climate data and they go, they go up, down, all around. There were droughts, there were floods, and that's just, that's just looking at the climate shocks. And what we see in other work is that it generates, those in turn generate a whole bunch of downstream livestock and crop shocks. And then those, gener you know, and, and they don't, and household, health and idiosyncratic shocks. And in the background is all the financial monetary instability. I think that people were, I think that the responses in at the end line were largely, they seem to me to 
like a very tired and frustrated population just the, and people might have got become desensitized to shocks that what is what was abhorrent five years ago is now the norm so they don't see it as a shock anymore but i had that sense looking at the data that it just the shock reporting just didn't make sense looking at the outside data Luis, do you have thoughts on that um definitely um so the results that we are looking are uh, because of the intervention of the project, I will say yes. Um, that the initial intention of the project probably didn't uh, took into consideration the initial design of the project that there was going to be a series of shocks during that. It is also true. The project had to be adjusted, and as just Emmanuel also mentioned, there were running parallel emergency programs in the same area at the same time. Um, can we say that all the, re the the results from the project are only because of the project implemented over there? There were so many different uh, initiatives also happening over there. And remember, you are working through the government, and the government was also implementing their parallel programs in, in here. Uh, what I I would say is that the quantitative was able to capture the effect of the shocks in the whole population and the qualitative was able to kind of understand what people were feeling that the project did for them and how they whatever they received from the project is helping them during and after those shocks. Um, it's very difficult to try to separate uh, one from the other one because that's how people were perceiving that on the ground. Monica? Okay, thanks. Thanks to both of you. Um, moving on to a non-methods question. Uh, Luis, this is for you. There are outstanding outcomes achievement under Purpose 2. Can you talk more about the integration between purpose one and two as main factors of success? Yes, um, definitely the food production and income generation was definitely the whole idea to support, uh, improve household uh, nutrition. And in this term, the indicator was the condition of children under two and children under five. And there were on another series of uh, indicators that were supporting that. Uh, there were activities that were planned and the most interesting thing is that those activities were integrated at the community level doing by community leaders, by volunteers, and in some cases people were participating in two or three different activities through the program. Um, there were activities implemented during the diner first, uh, the promotion of the orange flesh uh, sweet potato that had a direct link with the nutrition as well. The diversification of crops that also was an issue of looking into marketing, but at the same time, how to support um, food diversification as well. Um, definitely at those levels, there was a linkage in terms of how the project was implemented and how these activities were supporting one another. And also it has to do with supporting and working with government structure because it was the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Health working together to support what uh, the communities needed. Um, yes? Okay, thanks Luis. Uh, another one for you Luis. Uh, regarding management aspects. Um, the writer says, quite a few of the challenges across all initiatives appear to be at their core logistics and coordination. What kind of management conclusions have been made? Uh, not very glamorous in terms of recommendations, however, often a crucial point of departure. We need to learn more in this arena. Can you speak a bit about uh, the management aspect? Yes, <clears throat> this was also an, a challenge for the team because as I mentioned before, the team, the evaluation was conducted after six months the project had ended. And one of the key challenges that we had was trying to reach key staff working on the field or who were already working with other organizations to be able to get that sense. Um, there were definitely, uh, we were able to sense, but we really, really 
couldn't document all that much that uh, especially when you have a very large integrated with multiple partners with multiple years uh, management issues that could have been supported we did interview people like the chief of party and also implementing partners and there was a mechanisms uh, in place in order to support the coordination level um, but there were also delays in terms of the funding because there were, we have two years uh, I believe 2017 and 2018 that were unlikely a years in terms of funding from the federal government and that also affects the coordination of activities on the ground in terms of management um, three organizations implemented in three different locations, although it was the same program, but the, each organization has its own culture and its own way of implementing activities that increases also the level of complexity. Um, if we should make some lessons learned in here, again, it's having a very good uh, understanding of the project and how the project is going to be implemented, but at the same time, a good data management and communication system. So the information flows from the field to the different implementing partners, gets analyzed, gets uh, distributed, and then it goes back. That really helps and supports the management and or the project on a monthly, on a quarterly basis. Great. Um, we've got about seven or eight minutes left, so I'm trying to work in a range of, uh, of the remaining questions, and I apologize in advance, we're not going to get to everyone's questions. Um, but let's talk a little bit about WASH. Uh, in the recommendations, you mentioned capacity building in water management. Is that for irrigation? Was there any issue regarding drinking water? Any relationship with nutritional status results? Please. The project was not really focusing that much on irrigation. They did a couple of things and we thought that that was an area that there is a huge potential in new areas um, in order to support um, not only um, food production, but also some income diversification in the area. In terms of uh, wash and management, the project was basically working on the software side. They were not really building new uh, wells, uh, they were more supporting the communities and the structures and how to manage the system at the same time linking that with the health component in order to support health and nutrition. And some of the recommendations of the project is that definitely the two components, the hardware and the software in terms of water needs to be addressed in order to really have an impact at the community, not only working on the community uh, coordination and management, but also the maintenance and the cleaning. And in some cases, the government is moving into those areas on uh, wall um, uh, doing and, and preparing new wells, which is a big factor in those areas. Um, and that is also linked with the issue of the latrines. Uh, we saw that people and people were really proud about the number of latrines that they have built and also that there was no human defecation at the community level and that was positive. And they were also referring that that was some of the reasons why they have so seen a reduction in terms of their diarrhea cases at the community level. This was not supported by the uh, qualitative data that we have. However, the perception of the people was that all these latrines were functioning. But when we look into the latrines, the quality of the latrines and if they were used or not used, that was something that definitely could have been improved, uh, having a probably more strategic approach and working with communities and make them work properly. And although there was no human defecation, all the animals were roaming free in the community, cows, chickens, dogs, dogs, everything. And so, um, having the latrines but not con not uh, taking care of the animals in the in the village had also an impact on the health and the, on the nutrition so going back again uh, the wash component is important uh, it really needs to be look and address link very closely with the health and nutrition component as part of that but also looking into what are the needs of the community and the ability of water and how to use it 
Thanks, Luis. Another one for you. <laughs> um, let's talk about youth a bit. I know this has come up in some of our other end lines as well. Uh, the question is, how would you see the greater youth contribution under Purpose 3? What was missing? How would you see the results with more, co with more youth contribution? In the case of Ubali, we saw that they were <laughs> using youth to transfer messages and youth was pretty much touched in all the different components and activities of the organization of the of the project but it was mainly either participating as just any other people on the different components or through the gender champions or through um just another activity that was just to transfer and, and spread messages over there youth has a huge potential uh, to lay the foundations for innovation, for new areas, for new activities over there. And that's where we saw a lack of, there was an opportunity over there that was not really harnessed in order to use and focus uh, youth activities linked to what the project was doing. And uh, we can give a couple of examples. Uh, youth were really engaged on the silk activities, but they were just engaged just like any other participant or in the animal health workers or with the agricultural farmers. There could have been some activities focused on youth entrepreneurship and looking into non-farm activities uh, or income generations. Or um, in, there were a couple of cases where youth were um, also participating as PSPs for the silk providers. And in those areas, the youth were more motivated and looking into how to really expand what they were doing and using for the community. Um, I would say that a lessons learned for future uh, projects should be, and it is actually, um, that youth has a huge potential on different activities and non-agriculture non income generation activities should be looking into that. Uh, definitely for messages, I have no problem with that part, but you have to move from training and messages into action with youth in order to really create these opportunities. And remember, these youth eventually are going to move and become farmers or they are already farmers and how you can pro help them and promote them so they can really uh, keep supporting community activities and their families. Okay, we've got time for one or two more short questions. Um, and I want to encourage the audience to, if you've, if you've posted a question that has not yet been answered, we've actually had some audience members stepping forth um, who have been involved with the project uh, to answer some of those questions. So, so thank you. I saw Dane Friedenberg. Thank you for those inputs. So. Um, we should be sure to just scroll back up and see if anyone had any comments on, on, on questions you posted. So um, I'm going to do one, one for Stephanie and then we'll end with one on gender for Luis. Um, again on methods, Stephanie, was there any analysis on the impact of participation in packages of interventions? Uh, for example, did households that participated in multiple aspects of the project have better outcomes or greater resilience? Um, than those that uh, were just in one or two components? Okay, that's a great question. We did see actually, um, and we're start, I'm starting to see across lots and lots of evaluations that the really compelling benefits of layering both within, you know, within like specific areas like crop practices and then across areas as well in value chain and crop. It's definitely the case that more is better. Um, sometimes, not, I haven't looked at it closely here, but sometimes what we see is, is programming would be better off to, ex, to expand the number of, of interventions that households are involved in instead of trying to get more and more households to just have one intervention, because a lot of times one intervention is not that much different than zero interventions. But we see incredible power of layering both within areas and across, layer, across areas. It seems like it's absolute should be absolutely mandatory in the um, program design. It's super compelling, uh, both here and in other, in other evaluations, we've seen it. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. We're gonna end with a gender question um, for Luis. And we've got about one minute left <laughs> of, this, uh, of this hour. So Luis, under the gender perspective, what are the main learnings in terms of gender contributions 
uh, around social norms, cultural norms. Um, what are the, what's the main learning in terms of purpose to achievement? Um, so that's the, that's the nutrition purpose. Hmm. That's a very, this is a very good question. And we spend a lot of time talking about how gender was interconnected and how the efforts of the project was supporting all the different components of the project. Um, we noticed that because of Ubale, um, also other projects, pretty much a lot of the projects implemented in the southern part of Malawi, they also had a gender element because it was a reality and a need. There was a lot of sensitization on the community. People, they know about gender. Now the issue was moving from knowledge into practice. And that practice actually becomes changing some of the norms. And one of the things we have a lot of focal group discussions with women and focal group discussions with men and focal group discussions with um, also with uh, traditional authorities and they knew about that. So that was not a problem. And they were starting, they were starting to see changes in the behaviors of men and behaviors of women, which were moving in the positive area. Um, for example, um, men uh, were participating and going with women when they were having these sessions on nutrition for their kids. So the men were also understanding what was happening and they were helping also in the decision making, which was another issue. The decisions were not only made by men in terms of the health of the woman and in terms of the health of the children, so, but they were participating on that. So we started to look into those changes in behaviors and the culture of the areas. Um, we were just laughing one day because um, there was these focal group discussions and Ruth, who is our health expert, she was talking with women about issues of gender. And then uh, men, they were just saying, well, it's important for us to help women also in the, all the health care of the family, but also in the chores of the family. Because if women are not tired at the end of the day, they have more time for us as well, so we can have a much better relationship at, at, during the night. So men were understanding that if they can help, they can get something positive as well. And that was changing the norm. That was changing behaviors at the family level. And that was something that had been seen by different groups. And they, the interesting thing is that they are continuing working on those issues as well. Thanks so much, Luis. Well, on that, on that positive note, we're gonna have to close the Q&A for today. Um, thanks to all the panelists for, for your contributions and to the audience for some really good questions. And again, apologies, we couldn't reach all of them today. Uh, I'm going to need to turn this over to Emily just for some final words on, on next steps about the report and evaluation. Thank, Thank you, you everyone you, for Emily. joining. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Thank you everyone for joining today. As you'll see in the chat box, we've pasted a link for a, a brief one minute event evaluation. We greatly appreciate if you could please fill that out. Um, it will help us improve on future events. Um, and the Ubale final evaluation report will be published shortly. It's in its um, finalization stages now, and we'll be sure to share that once it is published. And as um, we've said earlier in the presentation, we'll be sharing the recording and slides with everyone who registered. Thank you all, and please um, fill out the event evaluation. Have a good rest of your day.